For those that have listened to radio over the past uh, 20 or so years, you might recognize the voice of my guest today. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. It was about five years ago I had the pleasure of working with this individual in a common ministry and got to know her well there. Very talented, you probably will recognize her voice. You may know her as Kelly Green when she first started working at um, USA Radio News a number of years ago. She married and her name became Kelly Sloan. During the time that, that I worked with her at this one common place, her husband, well, she lost her husband to cancer. Since that time we worked together, well, she's remarried and now living in Maryland. Now, before I get to that portion of the program, I want to remind you, this is Truth to Ponder. And would you share this program and this podcast with others? We're now entering our third month of doing the program. And I'm excited with the number of people that are beginning to to contact the radio show and podcast on a regular basis. I'm beginning to make a whole new set of friends. And I hope that sometime... I've been getting a lot of letters, and I feel very negligent. There's so much going on right now, and it's just me, and I've got at least nine letters I need to respond to. So if you haven't heard back from me, my apologies. I'm trying to do this program and a lot of other things at the same time. This world truly is a changing place. If you listen to Monday and Tuesday's broadcast with my guest, Dr. Timothy Gales, He and I have been trying to make heads or tails of this world where we live now. And what is this COVID virus all about? Every day, I look at people that I know on social media, and they'll make some posting. And and others will say, you can't be that way. There are people dying. They're dying rapidly. It's a horrible thing. You're selfish. You're not wanting to do this, that, or the other. And I try to wrap my mind around that and and try to understand when did we get into a position where we worry so much about disease? And you say, well, well, Bob, listen, you know, this is this is the coronavirus. Had you ever heard of a coronavirus five years ago? Most of you probably had not. It wasn't something we thought much about. We have had all kind of pandemics, even in my lifetime. H1N1 flu was supposed to be a major killer. We didn't lock down the economy and destroy businesses for H1N1. So why are we doing it for the coronavirus? And and I've been trying to study carefully what has been done in some countries versus what's been done in others. And I always go back to the the model in Sweden where they just don't seem to have people filling up their hospitals and dying, and they never really locked down. They just took some reasonable measures of precaution. I'm sure some of us know somebody. I know three people in my circle of friends around the United States, not not where I live, but around the United States that have been impacted by COVID-19. All three have recovered. And I've got a pretty extensive friend list, so I know three. I also worked in emergency management long enough to recognize that a lot of people were said to have died of COVID-19, but that's not what really killed them. Perhaps some other disease they've had for an extended period of time. Some cases, cancer, and and even, yep, even gunshot wounds and motorcycle accidents were ringed up as COVID-19 because the person allegedly had showed symptoms or had tested positive somewhere along the way. I can't imagine Americans buying into this scenario that's going on in our country today 30 years ago. I don't think Americans would have stood for it. But now we have governors that lock things down, and they really don't care about the people that they're hurting. 
they got to keep the fear alive. Right now, we have a lot of cases. But magically, for the first time, we don't have anybody coming down with the flu. I'm having a hard time figuring out that one. We need to be very careful and try to understand how things like this can be used against you, against your personal freedoms, and control the way you live. I'm reading stories where, you know, college colleges want to have uh, a tracking software on their students' cell phones so they can't wander too far away. They want to have all their medical information, too. Do you see what's happening? We are so in fear of a virus, we're willing to surrender our freedoms. And a lot of people are not stopping to count the cost. It's one of those things we try to talk about and and try to seriously get to the bottom of on this program. Once again, if you are listening, let me know. Go to our website, truththenumber2ponder.com, truththenumber2ponder.com, and I'll give you a mailing address in just a little bit if you'd like to contact me by the regular conventional mail. As I said as we started the program, those that listen to radio and have heard USA Radio News on a radio station over the years may recognize the voice of my guest today. When she first started out in her career, she was known as as Kelly Green. And when she got married, she was known to many, including myself, as Kelly Sloan. Well, her husband tragically passed away back in 2016. But she's since remarried and moved on in, in Maryland. And now she is known as uh, Kelly Arick. And so, Kelly, I want to welcome you to the program today. And can you tell us how how you got started in the broadcasting industry to begin with? Um, I was in college studying um, to be a news anchor on TV, and a friend introduced me to a school. It's called the Broadcasting Institute of Maryland in Baltimore, Mm -hmm. and you could get in and out in six months. So I went there, and I had a job two days after I got out of it. So that's how this whole thing started. So when you, when you first started in radio, and all of us that have been in the business, you probably ended up at a radio station. Were you an announcer at some station? Yeah, I was in. I did everything. You mm-hmm. know? I did promotions. I cleaned the office. I was an announcer, and then I said, you know, if you need somebody to do the news, I'll do that too. And mm-hmm. that just sort of stuck. And I, I see, I remember when I started out in radio, I did the same thing for a while. I did news, and I, I was very fortunate, because I'm a lot older than you are. Um, I, I traveled, and I covered uh, Jimmy Carter for a while in Georgia in my early news days, including when he uh, went to the Omni the night of the election. Wow. That's great. So, so yeah, I've, I've had some great, I have some great stories, too. Some of the, so so share some of the things that are the highlights of your news career, and uh, that that you remember that stand out. I think I've interviewed every politician <laughs> on the planet. Um, I when I worked at USA Radio News, I uh, I interviewed all politicians every day. I've interviewed Lindsey Graham about a dozen times. Um, uh, just all kinds of people. I've met. Mm-hmm. I've met President Ford. Mm-hmm. I met the president of Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just. It was just fun to be able to meet a lot of great people. And a lot of people would come into our studios, and um, you know, they talk about um, God and stuff. And and I always thought that was great. So um, I enjoyed meeting them and hearing their stories. You go back to USA Radio News. How many years uh, were you with USA Radio News? I was three years um, before Marla Maddox died, mm. and then a, a few years after that, and then they went uh, to an online where I worked from home, and I worked for them about a couple years after that. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of broken up. So maybe six years altogether, but the best part was when I worked um, in the beginning in 1998 through 2000, right before 9-11, mm-hmm. and um, I worked for Marla Maddox. And uh, that was the best one because we were all together. We were all in, you know, a, a big room, big newsroom. I worked with one guy who chased the motorcade um, when JFK was shot, chased mm-hmm. the motorcade to the uh, hospital. 
And, um, you know, just uh, I worked with great people there. I can remember USA Radio News uh, quite well because they had both a commercial and non-commercial version of their news available back in the day. And uh, I worked for an outfit that carried the non-commercial back in the 80s and into the 90s when that first started under Marlon Maddox. And he had a program called Point of View, and that, that was the launching point, I think, for the entire USA Radio News division, which you worked for. And uh, there are a lot of radio stations that I can remember uh, had them as their newscast, all kind of formats, top 40, middle of the road, country, Christian. It didn't matter. You heard that news sounder for USA Radio News all over the dial from coast to coast. And Marlon did that radio show for years. And I'm trying to remember uh, Kirby, trying to do his last name, that that took the show over later on. Can you remember that? who, who that was? I, oh, yeah, I know Kirby, but I can't remember his last name at the moment. And You're like Dexter. me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember it. Oh, yeah, of Marlon. course. That's how it always works. But, you know, he took over for a while. I never heard it much after Marlon uh, passed, you know, stopped doing the program, uh, or at least where I was in an area where I couldn't hear it anymore. But but I remember it well, point of view. Uh, one of the stations that I, I, I operated uh, carried it every day, you know, and it was, you know, live, I guess, from Dallas, Texas at that time, if I'm not mistaken, or that Absolutely. somewhere in that market. Am I right? Absolutely, because they were um, they were in the same newsroom as we were. They were just a few feet away. Mm-hmm. And if I got a hold of a good story, I'd make it, long, you know, because I was doing stories that were like, you know, 30 seconds mm-hmm. for a newscast. But if I got a good one and I wanted to make it longer, I'd give it to Marlon and he would run it on point of view. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they were right in the studio next to us. Kirby Anderson. Kirby Anderson. Kirby Anderson. Kirby Anderson. Yep, yep. Yeah. It's, it's been a long time. And, uh, but USA, I believe, is still around. But, I, but, you know, I'm not sure what their status is these days. Um, I know they're out there and I know they're still producing a program or two. And uh, I've been trying to find out more, but so far I haven't had any any real luck in doing that. When you look at the world today and, you know, you you look at it with a news person's eyes and and people that have worked in news or are what I call, you know, news hawks, the type that read everything you can get your hands on. The world is a different world today than the one you and I knew from years ago. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The world has changed. What are the things you miss the most from the world we had, let's say, even a year ago? The freedom. Freedom. Every every day when I walk out of the house, I have to decide if I'm ready to get into battle with somebody Mm -hmm. just to go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So most days I just don't. And you're not alone. You know, I just (laughs) – it's terrible. You know, I want to pick my own meat. You know, but I, you know, I get it delivered or, you know, my daughter will go because, um, you know, it doesn't bother her as much as me, but I can't wear a mask. It, it's, it, within seconds, I'm start having panic attacks. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and at my age, when I wear them after a while, I start getting dizzy. I mean, because of just the lack of oxygen at my age. I mean, it's just something that doesn't work. I can, I can make it about five to ten minutes and after that i've got to get out or take it off there's no there's no unless you want me to pass out on the floor at walmart it's got to come off at some point because you know these here's something you may you may already know this but having a wife that works in an operating room or did what people don't realize with these little paper made in china surgical masks you're buying at walmart that are you know just knockoffs of what they use in a hospital do um, you realize they turn the oxygen up in the room uh, to accommodate those masks because they do limit the oxygen to your brain and people get a little woozy and you don't want somebody woozy that's, you know, got a scalpel in his hand. And, and people don't understand that these were never designed to be worn outside of a sterile environment. I mean, they're not. And so I've got an issue with this making everybody wear this stupid paper surgical mask that was designed for a room with increased oxygen, changed regularly, and never designed to be in a non-sterile environment. We, we are doing things today that defy common sense. And then we have the CDC that comes out with this magical study. I think it was last week, if I'm not mistaken, this magical study that, gee, maybe the mask does protect you after all. 
and they're discounting 45 years of heavy research and science and triple blind studies just for a study that you can't find that says, well, it might help you. And, and people are just buying into it. You know and I know people read headlines or they hear bits and pieces. And the headline or the story may say uh, there is evidence a mask might protect you. And people hear it is it does protect you. And they run with it. You know, has that been your experience with people when it comes to casually absorbing the news? Yeah, I mean, no, they're just flat out scared that they're going to die. Mm-hmm. It, it's really just beyond. I mean, at least here, my sister lives in South Carolina. She says it's much better where she is. Oh yeah, but yeah, because she just moved. Um, but but uh, yeah, no, people are just flat out scared. They're like, if you if you breathe on them, they're just going to die. Everybody's going to die. I know. It's over the. Yeah, I've I've come and to conclude everything, and I don't even know where they get their news from because I'm not hearing that news. Mm, I know. <laughs> You know, like I was saying earlier, you know, to you, we're, we're in a case demic right now. A lot of cases, and I'm looking at the other numbers that just aren't tracking with those numbers like back in, you know, March, April, May, and even up till June. And we hear about cases, 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 and more cases. And we're not hearing anything this year about the flu. Got a friend of mine that works in the industry um, how do I put it? He works with a bunch of nursing homes. I'll just put it that way. And I said, so how many people have the flu in your nursing homes this year? He goes, nobody. How many last year? Lots of them. How many with coronavirus? Ah, those are the flu. Those are the flu cases called Corona now because the symptoms are identical. You know, you have the runny nose, the cough, the upper respiratory congestion, a fever, uh, fatigue. Gee, that sounds like the common flu to me from year in, you know, over the years. And now we're calling it Corona. So we're having the fall case demic just in time for more panic during the election cycle. I mean, that's just how I feel about it. Yes. And more panic right before the holidays. Oh, yeah. Now you have you have these. Mayor Lightfoot, for example, you know, the sweetheart of, uh, of of Chicago, you know, saying cancel those Thanksgiving plans, Christmas. I mean, this is like the Grinches that are stealing the holidays and and I'm surprised they're not you know, stealing candy from babies right now. And and all for what? I mean, we hear about cases, 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 and I deal with people all the time. They're in this panic that, well, you, we have to do this or somebody's going to die. Well, who's going to die? Well, it could be anybody. Well, well, if they're in a nursing home, they should be protected. If you have an elderly relative, you know, you need to be careful in your interaction with that individual that may be compromised like you would with the flu or should anyway. I mean, right. we, we, we've gone into this fear of, of death. And this is one of the problems, I think, with the secularization of our world that we are now so afraid of death and dying that we don't live anymore. We have ceased living. And, uh, you know, if, if all you do is worrying about dying, you're no longer living. You're, you're just, you know, you're among the living dead. You're like a zombie because, you know, I'm, I'm just afraid. I, I got to share this. When I was in Virginia uh, about a month or so ago, had to fly up there. And... It's amazing. They make you stand six feet apart in the line to get on the airplane, and boy, they're 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 strict about it. They got these, you know, you got these uh, former mall guards now turned airport security. Stay six feet apart, six feet apart. You got to be six feet apart, or you're going to kill somebody with your corona. I mean, th- this is the whole. Oh, so we're standing six feet apart to go to the gate. Then walk out on the tarmac. These are small little commuter jets. You know, they're not even, you can't even use the the arm coming out. And so we're six feet apart, walking out to the plane. They're keeping us six feet apart, six feet apart. Then I get on an airplane, and I got this big dude, bigger than me, shoulder to shoulder, head to head for the next hour and a half. I mean, right. <laughs> it, it, this is the kind of silliness that's defies going on. Logic. It, it it All yeah. of it defies logic. So... Somehow the coronavirus will spread inside the airport if we're not six feet apart. Um, yeah. But in an airplane, I can have a guy's head, you know, 12 inches from mine, you know, literally. And then we get our little, you know, snack and we can take our mask off. 
for the next 20, 30 minutes. And, and like somehow we're not, it doesn't spread inside the airplane. We just have to wear this thing on our face whenever we're not eating or drinking something. It, it's ridiculous what they've gone to. Now, you're, you're in the state of Maryland. And so what are some of the restrictions up there that don't make any sense to you? I mean, I'm just, I'm going to ask. Most of them. Most of them, yeah. Most of them. Yeah, um, the, all restaurants have to close at 10 o'clock. Because mm-hmm. I guess at 10.01, that's when Corona comes out. Mm-hmm. And they're they're um, encouraging people to um, report each other. I know two restaurant owners um, near me, and both of them were shut down for, for like four or five days because someone complained to the health department mm-hmm. that another patron had a mask on under their nose. Ooh, yeah. And they I came see. in. Yeah. And, you, you know, it wasn't the re- the restaurant. Yeah, no, the restaurant staff's like, we can't police everybody who comes in here. You know, we're busy. We're working. We're trying to get food out. And, um, you know, the, the patrons had it under their nose. They they reported it. And, and the police came in like um, like there was a robbery, <sighs> three or four of them, like a SWAT team. Very dramatic. And this has happened twice that I know of, and I'm sure it's happened more. And then they, the newspaper publishes their names. They were closed for health reasons. And um, it's, it's, just, it's sickening. They're trying to get rid of small business around here. I'm convinced of that. I, I think that you're right. And these are some of the things that, you know, I've been dealing with on this program. There, there are three. When I started this program a few months ago, there were several things that were impressed upon my heart. And, and one of them was to prepare Christians and the church for the world to come. Uh, regardless of how this election turns out, and I'm not going to say yay or nay because it's not been declared. CNN does not have the ability under the Constitution to declare the presidential winner, NBC, ABC, CBS, don't matter. Uh, It'll happen when they're all certified and the electors meet sometime in December. Then we actually have a, quote, president-elect. Until then, we have, uh, you know, Citizen Joe, that's about it. Uh, acting like he's going to be the president. I mean, this is this is how it is. Uh, nobody's conceded, and there's still questions, lots of them. And that's my next question for you that comes to mind. When you look at this election, um, what do your instincts tell you from all the years you've been doing news? What's your instincts? My instincts are that everything's way off. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember on election night, it was maybe about 10 o'clock, and you know, and I'm watching and, and um, they hadn't called a lot of states yet. And but but Trump was leading That's by a right. lot, maybe by like 10 percent. Mm-hmm. And then I dozed off for a little bit and woke up a little bit later. And all of a sudden, Biden's leading mm-hmm. in all these states. I, and I just didn't believe it. It just is something is just off. There's something in my spirit says, no, this is off. This is off. And, um, you know, I, I did the election in 2000. I was working that night at USA. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was the one, you know, following, you know, all the calls and everything. And we actually called it for George Bush. But, you know, even it just didn't feel as eerie and gloomy in the days afterward while we were waiting for the courts to make their decision. It didn't feel it feels evil now. It didn't feel that way. Then it just felt like, oh, this this stinks. We got to wait, you know, but this has a whole different vibe. Well, when you look at when you look at Florida 2000, and of course, I was living in Florida at the time on the West Coast, and we we saw what was happening in three very targeted areas, primarily Broward County first, Palm Beach second, and to a lesser degree, Miami-Dade, where the Gore team came in trying to get recounts just in those three counties to try to find those last few votes to push them over the top. And, they, and, and there's some pictures, I've got one that I, I always remember, of people sitting around a table with their heads looking toward the heavens at a ballot with, you know, with jeweler's loops on, trying to see if maybe somebody, maybe they touch the little gore place, you know, that, that maybe we can give it to him after all. It, it was just crazy what they were trying to do. And after 37 days, the Supreme Court says you can't keep counting them till you get the results you want. You know, count them once accurately and be done with it. But trying to interpret what a voter may have been thinking or not thinking and trying to read their minds became insanity, just total insanity. This has a totally different feel. 
uh, because we're seeing multiple states and there are too many things coming out that make me very suspect that I think there was some widespread look mail-in universal ballots were an opening for cheating in my opinion I don't know about you but it, it when you we had more dead people this time vote than any time I can remember in my lifetime even people 127 years old have been voting this time around yeah yep i i got two ballots one for me and one for my husband mm-hmm. and i thought what's to stop me from filling out his i mean we're on the same team and all that but i'm it was just thinking to myself you know i could very easily fill out his ballot of course and and how many i, I look at the they're people that live like in apartment complexes and they they they've been saying well we got seven or eight ballots came to my address for the people that have lived here over the past 10 years and you know i guess right. i could fill them all out too and mail them back and who'd ever know the difference especially exactly. when they're not especially in a lot of states that decided not to uh, use the signature verification much anymore so we have a lot of those issues going on as well right i just have this strange feeling that the world that you and I knew growing up is about to change forever. And a lot of what we took for granted a year or two ago is not coming back. Now, i got to take a break here real quick, and I want you to hang on. I want to remind you, this is Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. Our website is truth2ponder.com. That's truth2ponder.com. We will be right back. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to part two of the Wednesday edition of Truth to Ponder. And I'm your host, Bob Bierman. I want to thank the many that have taken the time to write the program by mail or even contact the program via email from the website. My email address is pretty simple. It's bob at truth2ponder.com, truth2ponder.com. And just so you know, we're not some big organization. We're not some big corporation or big church ministry. It's just me. And so I get to produce the show, put it together, distribute it, run the web page, and do the editing, and also check the email. So you can write that directly to me at truth2ponder.com. A number of you have been using U.S. mail, and I appreciate that. And you could write us if you prefer. My name is Bob. Last name is Bierman, B-I-E-R-M-A-N-N. And the address here at our Georgia home is 21 Berkshire Lane. That's 21 Berkshire Lane. Add the number 263. That's our little P.O. box that our post lady needs. And we are in the city of Sky Valley, two words, Sky Valley, in the state of Georgia, and the zip code 30537. On my part, this is a labor of love. I don't get paid to do this, but I do have to cover the shortwave bill. And any help you can, you can do that from the website. Every bit is appreciated. It all goes to pay for the airtime if you'd like to help. I'd appreciate it so much. My guest is a good friend of mine. We worked together for a while at a ministry. I'm not going to mention where. And I remember her voice for quite a long time from the USA Radio Network. They're still around. A lot of radio stations both commercial and non-commercial, use USA Radio News. Maybe you remember her as Kelly Green, and when she got married, she became known as Kelly Sloan. Now, I remember when her husband passed away a number of years back, and uh, I know how difficult that is. I've been through that myself. And she has since, though, remarried, and now she's Kelly Horick. So want to welcome her back to the program today. Talented broadcaster, someone that really needs to to do more of it again. I, I wish you would, Kelly. I really do. You're very talented, and God has given you so much to share. Uh, Kelly, when you look at the world today that we live in, and it is a very changed world, 
Do you think that after COVID-19 is behind us, do you think it's ever going to get back to the way it was? No, I don't think it'll ever be the same. And, and why, why I think it's you, gone too far. We, we see it in politics. It, we see it in, in – look at social media. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, when I first got involved with my first account with, you know, Facebook, it was such a benign place to be. Uh, Twitter never really appealed to me too much, uh, but I had a Twitter account, and I've used it, of course, in, in media. But what we've seen since 2016, and it's been ratcheting up a little bit every year, and now it's ratcheted over the top, where we're... Facebook is now the Ministry of Truth, I mean, from Orwell. I mean, you say something that they don't agree with, they will they will shut you down. They will give you a 30-day suspension. They will make you a non-person. And, and that scares me. I mean, I, they, they bragged, oh, five, eight years ago, it is a forum of totally free speech, and it really isn't. They, they use that as a, as a bait and switch to get everybody over there. Now that they've got you and you're afraid to give up your account, they, they're, they're busy telling you what you're allowed to, to think and say and do on the platform. And Twitter's even worse. Uh, the guy that runs Twitter, I, I swear, I've seen better looking meth addicts in my, <laughs> coming to jail than, than this, than Dorsey. I mean, they, I mean, literally, I, I have. And, and this guy's a piece of work. I mean, he, he sounds brainless and clueless, and he's the CEO of, of Twitter. Yeah. And 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 you got Zuckerberg, Mr. Innocent going, we don't do that. We deal with the truth and that's all we deal with. And, and it's like they're partners in deception, in my opinion. If you say anything that goes against their desired narrative, even if their narrative is not scientific, but political, you get crushed like a bug. And, and I just and too many people have got too much of their life in Facebook. There's no doubt in my mind. We're putting too much of our life on Facebook. And you're not going to win an argument on Facebook either, so don't even bother. You know, I, I say the things that I do. I'm careful not to get myself in trouble. Um, I use it as a resource, not as what I do for a living or my life. I don't want my life on Facebook anymore. When you look at the future, yeah. what do we peop- what do we do as people uh, to function in this new world that's being unraveled before us. We don't know if it's going to be rapid. Some people think quicker. Some people think slower. I think Dr. Fraud, also commonly known as Dr. Fauci, seems to change on a dime everything that he says. He says one thing one week, something else the next week, and there's never been any consistency. And, And I've revealed that in the program with his own words over the past nine months that he has changed like nine or ten times on the same topic, you know, right down to the vaccine and everything else, which I'm very not trusting yet. I, I've, not that it has anything oh, to do with Bush. I, I mean, with 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 uh, with Donald Trump, I, I don't I don't look at it as as that being the issue. It's just what is the what has been the driving force behind the coronavirus? And I don't care what anybody says. The driving force has been China. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that China is the driving force for for the virus. Absolutely. And control, controlling the people. Because it it seems like they've never been able to control us in the past, but now they have everybody is just bowing down to everything they say out of fear. Mm -hmm. And they're just so scared. And I refuse to live in fear. I just, you know, if I catch a virus, I catch a virus, I'll get better. That's right. you know. And, you know, so I, I don't worry about it. You know, I mean, people, I remember with the with the H1N1 back in 2009, I was in the mm-hmm. grocery store and somebody coughed on me. And I thought for one second, oh, great, now I'm going to get get that. And then I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not getting it. Just mm-hmm. refuse to get it. So you, you just, you have to live your life. And, um, but, yeah, I think it's going to be, I think what we need to do is just educate people. That's right. And, and I try to just. I try to talk to as many people as I can, even my own mother, you know, and I'm like, this is all about control. And she's very shocked. It is. Are you sure? I'm like, yeah. You know, they just want to control what we do and um, and get us all to obey. Next, they'll try to take the guns, mm-hmm. you know, and you, this is tyranny. 
this is what was predict what has been predicted in the Bible. Absolutely, you know, 1984, um, and it's happening now before our very eyes. Mm-hmm. And I kind of knew it was. I kind of expected this about 20 years ago. I interviewed a guy, and he wrote a book about the next American Civil War. It was in 1998, mm-hmm. and he said it's not going to be between. Um, black people and white people. It's going to be between liberals and conservatives. And I thought he was crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, you know, 26 back then. I thought, oh, he's, he's just way out there, but this is coming true. And, and back then I interviewed, um, Ron Paul. He was congressman from mm-hmm. Texas. Then. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. I interviewed him like six times and he kind of said the same thing. And I thought he was crazy, but, the, but they're not. This is what's happening. So this has been building for a long time. And the thing is, the mainstream media will take people like a Ron Paul or anybody that believes that and try to make them out as some kind of a clown or some kind of a freak show or some kind of ill-informed, uh, you know, deplorable or whatever you want to call them. Right. And, and they are right. shamed because they believe something that doesn't fit their narrative. And and I, I, I look, I never thought I go back to the 1970s and i remember a a book that came out that was you know the hot read of the day that turned out to be wrong on so many levels that was hal Lindsay's the late great planet earth obviously the world did not end in in uh you know 1988 like he predicted i mean we kept on going and going and here we are today but i do believe what jesus said in the scriptures look for the signs of my coming and i always remind people of something else is this the great tribulation coming or just another one of the tribulations the world has seen in these 2000 years? I can't I can't tell you yay or nay, but in every one of those circumstances, whether it was in Russia which became the Soviet Union and you know 1917 or whether you were in Poland in 1939, whether you're in the continent of Africa during many of the wars that have occurred there or in China in the 1950s, the church was one of those things that got pushed underground. And and mm-hmm. religious freedom is one of the first things to go unless you become uh, a recognized official kind of church that the state can deal with. And 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 I, I believe there's some mainline denominations that have sold their soul to the world. Absolutely. And, and they no longer really, they, they are preaching what St. Paul calls, uh, calls another gospel. And and right. those kind of churches should be shunned. They'll be the ones allowed to to be open someday. But those that are th- those that are the true church, the remnant church, well, because of what you say and believe, you're you're not acceptable, and you can't say that on Facebook. And you'll have to literally, well, it's like one pastor friend of mine, and who's been a guest on this show. His entire ministry is preparing the church to go back to the catacombs. I mean, he's that's been on his heart and mind for 15 years, that he believed the day was coming, and people would laugh at him, just like they laughed at Noah, you know, building this ark out there. Uh, but I don't think some of these Christians that are mindful are laughing anymore. I think some of them are terrified. How do we react to this? And I think the time is coming when the true church may not be as visible as it once was, and it'll still grow if it's true. If it's true to God's word, what do you, what does your heart tell you about what can happen in twenty twenty one? What what do you what what's just off the top of your head? I think it'll be worse. That's just a gut feeling. I, I just don't see anything getting better. I mean, we were locked down here in Maryland for over a hundred days in the mm-hmm. spring, mm-hmm. and then it's probably getting ready to happen again, you know? And uh, so you get a little reprieve and then it comes back with a vengeance. And Mm -hmm. I just, and no one's talking about people are complaining about it. Some people, but the majority of the people are just following along because they think that's what they have to do. Mm -hmm. So I think 21 is going to be a bad ride too. And I hope I'm wrong because I want to be optimistic. I know. I understand. um, I, I, I have to face that reality because I have to, I have to try to live my life in these circumstances. I've been mm-hmm. hopeful for so long, and I just keep getting down, down, down. So, my, I mean, I have hope in Jesus and, and hope in the Lord, and I, I don't live in fear. So I have that hope. But as far as hope here, I don't have any hope no. for what's going on around me in this world. Well, the, what the Bible teaches don't put your hopes or your dreams on princes or any mere mortal. I mean, that's, that's, that's very clear. You know, 
it's it's fixated on Jesus Christ, our only hope. And I mean, we're, we're coming. Look, I'm, I'm with you. What we are seeing, we're never going back to the normal we had. We can try to be as normal as we think we can be within our own homes, but the outside of the door normal, I don't see that coming back. I, I see, I, I see gradually, especially in the blue states, where the arrogance of the leadership in the blue states, they. I'll just say it for what it's worth. They don't care. They don't no. care about you. They don't care if your business goes under. They don't care if you do without. They don't care if you freeze to death. They don't care because they're nope. just like anybody in government. Hey, I'm still if you're if you're Andy Cuomo, you're still getting your paycheck as you shut everybody down. If you're Governor Hogan, you're still getting your paycheck and your limo ride while everybody else does without. We're creating we're creating a class of of bureaucrats and politicians that become above the law. And and the worst part is most of those that make these hard and fast rules are the ones that break them more often than anybody else. I mean, they look at Newsom. He got caught going to a birthday party of a lot of people, yep. but it didn't. Oh, and, and and he gets to say, I'm just, oh, I'm sorry. If it was you or I, we'd be fined or going to jail for who knows how long. But it, but they yeah, seem to be absolutely. immune. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've been threatened three times with mm-hmm. calling the police because I had a mask under my nose. I was just, I need a couple items in the grocery store, and I just wanted to get in and get out, and I, I, and I had trouble. And um, they're like, if you don't put that mask on over your nose... Well, I argued with them first. I'm like, look, you know, I have a health condition. I can't wear the full mask over my nose. I can't breathe. And they didn't care. And then, it, you know, it, it got heated. And they're like, well, we'll just call the police. And I said, well, I'll just leave. But they had threatened me three mm-hmm. times. It mm-hmm. happened three, three times in like two weeks. So, but the governor gets away with everything. They do. Any any government employee yeah. does. I'm, look, I'm going to give you a little secret. I've been in a few emergency operations centers during this process and whenever the cameras are there from the tv stations everybody's got the little face diaper on i mean everybody looks like mm-hmm. we're into it the second the camera goes out the door they're gone now the, the car just pulled away they all come back off just yeah. so you know i mean this is what happens um the guy was talking about uh, heard a the guy shared a story he one of my friends uh, went to a doctor's office and got there a few minutes early it was lunch hour but somebody forgot to lock the door, so he came in, and there's all the staff. Everybody's sitting around with no mask on, and it was like, oops, we got caught. And mm-hmm. magically at 1 o'clock, he got there like 10 minutes before 1. At 1 o'clock, when the door would have been open, they all have him back on again. You know, yeah. it, 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 they're, Even doctor's offices are challenging the wisdom of these stupid requirements for wearing a face covering. They, they really are. Right. Um, I see a lot of stores where when the employees think they're out of the view of the public, those things come right off. Um, and, and nobody's, you know, falling, you know, falling down in the aisles and dying in these stores. It's, it's not happening. Uh, and, and where we are, I never thought, I never thought we could use psychological warfare to fool the American spirit, but I was wrong. Yeah. They, they have, they, they've succeeded and the problem now is, where do you find truth? How do you find the truth today? You know, what what would you, what is your advice for somebody looking to find out what's really going on in their in their communities and and in this world? What, what what's your what's your take? I'd say the Bible and reading about the elitists and the new world order and that plan because I've you know been reading about that for years. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then you re- and it, it, it works with Bible prophecy. I mean, they go together, and that's exactly what's happening now. And um, you know, I mean, call people conspiracies, and some are some are out there, but there's a lot of truth to it. I mean, they they want all the control, the elitists and the, and the, those in charge. They want all the control. They want the masses to be poor or to be sick or to depend on them, or to, you know, they depopulate all this depopulation stuff has been going on for years Mm -hmm. and um you know and 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 to me putting the covid patients like they did in new york back in the nursing home Mm -hmm. i mean what are you doing that's crazy i I believe they're trying to depopulate they're trying to thin thin that herd i really do believe that 
Oh, I agree. I, I, I agree 100%. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind with the things that I'm seeing in this world today that uh, what happened in New York was not was not an accident. I don't care what anybody says. Um, would I dare say, Would I am I sinister enough to think that uh, Governor Cuomo wanted to have a lot of people die in his state to make a political point? Um, I think his heart is that hardened where he would. I, I, I mean, I remember these words, and I'll have to resurrect them. I've got them somewhere uh, recorded. An interview that he did, or actually a press conference that he did sometime toward the end of April, when the numbers in New York State just first started coming down. And, and he sat there. You know, in his chair with his, you know, governor of New York, uh, you know, uh, field jacket on. And he just sat there and he goes, God didn't do this. Prayer didn't do this. Faith had nothing to do with this. We did this. And I remember that he just literally came out and said, God is powerless. I, St. Andrew Cuomo, I did what he was really saying is I got the virus to stop. I made everything better. You know, fall down and worship me and my my newscaster and personality brother. We know more than anybody. And and they are both some of the most two of the most evil people that I can imagine. I, I just can't believe how New York State can survive with the evil that is Andrew Cuomo. I just can't. But they keep voting him in. He's heading for a fourth term. Can you believe that? Yeah. yeah. No, I can't believe it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. And that's why I go back to Bible prophecy, because it says in the end, nothing's going to make sense. And mm-hmm. this is the world we're living in. Absolutely. And, um, I, you know, I just can't even believe that somebody would vote for Joe Biden. Why would you vote for someone who openly, if you're not even trying to hide it, who openly says he's going to raise taxes and he's going to force a nationwide mask mandate and all this other stuff? And he openly says all this negative stuff and you vote for him. And who would vote for higher taxes? Well, that's assuming that he got all the votes that they claimed he got. That's something else that's still, (laughs) you know, that's part of the problem. But, But even those that I know that would have voted for him. They live in fear of the virus, so they think that somehow he's going to lock it down and we'll all be safe. Well, all going to be, you know, it was the Germans that told the Jewish people of Warsaw, hop on the train to be safe. Hop on the train. We'll take you to a safe place. Come on, we'll take you to safety. It's not safe here any longer for you. And this is what's happening in our world today. I really believe it. We, we, are, we are seeing a battle of good versus evil the likes which we've never seen before. Um, I think that spiritual I, warfare. I, I think that it was. I think Trump being elected four years ago was a fluke. They really had it planned for Hillary Clinton to be the president. They had it in the bag, and they they believed their own hubris about what they thought they knew, and that's why she never really campaigned much. She ignored Wisconsin. She ignored Michigan. She ignored Pennsylvania, and barely. She almost ignored Florida, and, and look what happened. She lost. Yep. She lost Ohio. She lost. She really believed she was going to just get by because the numbers, their polling said she would. And then the people spoke, and a lot of people just didn't vote. That They just didn't care for her that much. She was not an exciting candidate. And I think they were determined for four years they tried to remove Trump. Four solid years of false accusations and baloney. And then the election came, and my heart tells me the election was stolen because this is they, they don't want somebody that is a disruptor to the New World Order plan, and that's exactly what he became. He is a disruptor. They cannot deal with it. And so I, right. Absolutely. I don't believe we can even trust our own CIA anymore, honestly. We can't. Oh, yeah, or the FBI. Yeah, the FBI. I mean, they, how long they hold on to the, the laptop. Yep. And you haven't heard about it in the last two weeks. Yep. I know. Yep. I mean, if anybody else did that, they'd be they'd be arrested already, immediately. Mm-hmm. As, as we come to the end of today's program, is there anything that just comes on your heart and mind right now that if you, if you, like, this is your forum, what, what would you tell people 
what they need to be doing at this point in this in this hour today? What would you tell them? I would tell them to get informed, to know their Bible, know about the plans of the elitists and the New World Order and the deep state, know their real agenda, look, you know, do some research on that, and then tell people. And, and you know, the more people you tell, you know, I, I told my sister about some of this stuff that was going on and um, a long time ago. And, you know, it, she's like, wow, it really opened my eyes. And um, you, you just have to spread that word, even if it's just one person at a time, even if you're just talking to someone in a store or at a restaurant or a family member, just plant a seed so that people will want to learn more and they will do their research and say, hey, there's something going on here. And they were right. Kelly, I want to thank you for being on Truth to Ponder today. It's been good to work with you again. It's been so long. And I hope that my listeners to Truth to Ponder well, I hope you were encouraged by the things that she had to say, and and maybe you remember her voice from the time that she worked at, at USA Radio News, some other radio stations and ministries. We live at a very changing time, and, and I believe people, just like Kelly, need to be, well, their voice needs to be out there on the air, on a podcast. I've been saying for a long time, as this world goes into its time of change, we as Christians are going to have to find ways of communicating with each other and reaching out to a lost and dying world. The way we've done business in the United States, it's not going to be around much longer. I really feel inside of me there is a quantum shift coming in our world. Some people call it the great global reset. Whether it happens next year or a year or three from now remains to be seen. A lot of things are are hinging in the world of politics at the moment regards to how quick that can happen. We've seen we've seen how COVID nineteen has impacted people, their lives, their mental health, their families their churches, even their livelihood. As I said at the beginning of the program, and as Kelly and I talked about on the program today, many of these governors and people at the county health department level, whatever it is, they're going to get their paycheck regardless. They get paid even when your business is shut down. And you still owe tax to that government even if your business is shut down. And I'm sincerely afraid that hundreds of thousands of businesses will close their door forever, and they'll never come, never come back. The rise in, in drugs and alcohol, suicides and depression may end up being, well, it may impact more people in a negative way than COVID-19 could have ever hoped to have done by the end of this calendar year. Now, I'm serious about that. I know of so many people now that live in fear. They may never fully recover mentally from what all this has done to, quote, protect us. There are a lot of common sense things that that easily could have been done along the way in this process of trying to rid ourselves of this virus. And the scientific evidence is increasingly leaning toward the fact that the idea of a total lockdown of everybody and everything was probably the worst thing we could have actually done. But now, you may be living in fear, or you may know somebody living in fear. They can't function. When is this nightmare going to end? My question is, will it ever end? Or will this and things like it be used to usher in a new world order. A year ago, I don't care what church you went to, whether it was a Bible-believing church or not, nobody much cared that you gathered on Sunday. Nobody bothered you. Suddenly, churches are more impacted. Look what happened in California not that long ago. A judge ruled that, um, shall we say, strip clubs... You know, where 
women go take their clothes off to entertain men. That was somehow protected speech, but, you know, gathering at a church is still a problem. The liquor stores are open, but churches are a problem. We can go down the list of things that are open and closed, essential, non-essential, and how arbitrary some of those are. And, And honestly, in places like California, where Christian churches in particular have been singled out and dealed and dealt with more harshly. I pray that this program can be an impact to other people. And I want to thank uh, Kelly Arick for being on the program today, and I hope to have her back very soon. If the program is helpful and beneficial, let me give you my mailing address for those that want to use regular mail. You can write me, Bob Bierman, B-I-E-R-M-A-N-N, at 21 Berkshire Lane, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, in Sky Valley. That's Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. I would love to hear from you. We'll be back with the Thursday edition tomorrow, on air and also as a podcast. And until Thursday, this is Bob Bierman wishing God's greatest blessings upon you. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.